Okay, so welcome back to this video in which we are discussing uh, the clamp theory for uh, snare proteins involved in uh, synaptic neurotransmission. Okay, so so far we've discussed the formation of these core snare complexes. Now you're not just going to form one of these, you'll form multiple of them. So let me draw another one here to make the picture nice and symmetric. So, here we have uh, another synaptobrevin 2 molecule, uh, which is embedded in the membrane of the uh, vesicle. Here we have another syntaxin 1 molecule embedded in the membrane of the plasma, sorry, embedded in the plasma membrane. And here we have another SNAP25, which contributes these two alpha helices, um, which is attached to the plasma membrane. Okay, right. Uh, so, uh, these core snare complexes, then, uh, these alpha helices are going to wrap around each other, and basically this concept of them sort of forming this bundle is what's known as the zipper mechanism, or the, even better, the leucine zipper mechanism. This is a leucine zipper mechanism, and it's called that because what will happen is they start zipping together, they start... Um, twisting and intertwining together from these free ends initially, and then it works its way down just like a zip, basically. Okay, uh, so what will happen is they'll zip up, and as they zip up further and further along, what's going to happen is they're going to pull these two membranes together. They will pull the membrane of the vesicle closer to the membrane of the, the, the plasma membrane, the membrane of the cell, maybe I should say, the membrane of the axon terminal. Um, and um, then what's eventually going to happen is they're going to fuse. Now, that's not what you want. Because we've just created this synaptic vesicle. We don't know whether an action potential has come or not. Uh, and now we're getting it fusing with the plasma membrane. That's not right. You don't want that. You want the uh, vesicles, the, the synaptic vesicles, to be released only when an action potential comes along the axon and arrives at the axon terminal. You don't want them just released once they get to the membrane. No. So something has to stop... Um, these snares uh, fusing together the synaptic vesicle membrane with the plasma membrane. This is the clamp theory now. The clamp theory basically is that there must be some sort of protein he in here between the me vesicle membrane and the plasma membrane. So let's draw it in turquoise here. That holds the two membranes apart. So this is what's known as a clamp protein. And therefore stops these uh, core snare complexes from zipping up all the way. So the zipping up stops basically early on because they just can't zip up any further because this clamp protein is stopping the two membranes from getting any closer. And in order for the snare complexes to zip up any further, they need these two membranes to come closer together because they just uh, mechanically they can't get closer together unless they do. Okay, so... Um, that halts the zipping somewhere further, uh, you know, somewhere less far along, and stops the two membranes from fusing together. Now, uh, the speculated protein that may well be doing this is a protein known as complexin. So let me label that up. So the hypothesized protein here is a protein known as complexin. Okay. Now the clamp theory doesn't stop there. The clamp theory gives an explanation for how, um, how uh, the action potential arriving is coupled to the actual fusion of this vesicle now with the membrane. So at the moment, when you've got this clamp protein stopping the vesicle from fusing with the membrane, then the vesicle is in the docked state. It's being held at, in the active zone, ready for fusion to occur. And all that you need to do, basically, is remove this clamp protein, remove this complexin, and then the core snare complexes will continue their fusion process. They'll continue this zipping up process, and uh, they will bring the two membranes so close together that they'll then fuse, and you'll release the neurotransmitter into the vesicle. So, uh, sorry, into the synaptic cleft. So, uh, how does an action potential arriving um, remove this complexin protein? Well, when an action potential arrives, what it causes is a depolarization of the electrical potential difference across the membrane of the cell, or across the membrane of the axon terminal. So, what you do 
is you have voltage-gated calcium channels in the membrane of the axon terminal. Okay, now we'll have a little interlude where we discuss voltage-gated calcium channels. So, uh, this is a voltage-gated calcium channel. Now, voltage-gated calcium channels are often abbreviated as VGCC, for voltage-gated calcium channel. Okay, now voltage-gated calcium channels consist of multiple subunits. Now, the main subunit, which makes up the pore-forming unit, is known as the alpha-1 subunit. So what I've drawn, the actual pore of this uh, voltage-gated calcium channel, is the alpha-1 subunit. Now, uh, there are many different genes which encode for alpha-1 subunits of voltage-gated calcium channels, 10 overall, and only two of them are used in uh, neuron, neuronal axon terminals anyway. And those are the CAV2.1 gene and the CAV2.2 gene. Okay, now if you use the alpha-1 subunit, uh, well, sorry, if you use CAV2.1 to make your alpha-1 subunit, then the voltage-gated calcium channel that you produce is what's known as a PQ-type voltage-gated calcium channel. And if you use the CAV2.2 uh, volt uh, alpha-1 subunit, then the voltage-gated calcium channel you produce is what's known as an N-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Therefore, we say that the voltage-gated calcium channels in uh, neuronal axon terminals are PQ or N-type voltage-gated calcium channels. Now, there are other subunits of the voltage-gated calcium channel, auxiliary subunits, that don't form the pore, but mediate um, the function of the pore-forming unit and also the expression of the pore-forming unit. Okay, so here's the first one. This is the gamma subunit sitting alongside the alpha-1 subunit. So in blue here, we have the gamma subunit. So this is the gamma subunit. And then attached to the intracellular aspect of the alpha-1 subunit is the beta subunit down there. So in orange... That's the beta subunit. And then over here is the alpha 2 delta subunit here. Okay, so this is the alpha 2 delta subunit. So let me cover the alpha 2 delta subunit in pink. Okay, right. So um, the uh, auxiliary subunits, as I say, they modulate the function of the pore forming subunit. Now, basically, uh, what's going to happen is when the membrane depolarizes, it's going to activate these voltage-gated calcium channels of the N or PQ type. And uh, when they open, calcium is going to move in. The reason being, there is a massive, a massive great calcium gradient across the cell membrane. Calcium concentration in the extracellular fluid is approximately 1.5 millimolar. Okay, whereas calcium concentration inside the cell is approximately 100 nanomolar. So there is a big concentration gradient of calcium in, uh, uh, well, a big concentration and gradient of calcium, which favours the movement of calcium into the cell. So when this channel opens, calcium is going to move into the cell. Okay, now, the important uh, thing about this alpha-2 delta subunit is that it's going to result in this voltage-gated calcium channel being positioned nearby these uh, vesicles which are docked on the active zone of the plasma membrane. Okay, so it's going to be positioned somewhere maybe here, basically, is the actual position of these voltage-gated calcium channels, so that when they open, they don't just you know, spray calcium into the cytoplasm. Instead, they spray the calcium ions onto the synaptic machinery, okay? So the important thing to gain from all of this is that you have turned an electrical signal into a calcium signal, and the calcium is now going to cause the fusion of these vesicles. Okay, so how, how does calcium cause the fusion of these vesicles? Well, basically, in the, um, in the membrane of the vesicle, there is another protein that's important, known as synaptotagmin. So I'll put this here. Okay, so synaptotagmin, what colour should I colour in synaptotagmin? We'll have it in green. Okay, so in green here, this is synaptotagmin here. And basically, uh, when calcium goes up 
calcium is going to bind to synaptotarkin. So let me label this up. This is synapto. Hope it will fit in. Tagmin. Okay, there we go. Perfect. Uh, so when calcium goes up in the vicinity of synaptotagmin, calcium is going to bind to synaptotagmin. And what is believed to happen now is that the cal calcium activates the synaptotagmin, and then synaptotagmin moves this complexin protein, this clamp protein, out of the way. Then what will happen is the stalled uh, zippering mechanism of these core snare complexes will resume, and it will now uh, zip up right the way back down to these sort of roots, if you like, and that will bring these two membranes very close together as these coarse air complexes form tight bundles, basically. And when those membranes are brought close enough together, they will fuse and release the neurotransmitter contents within this synaptic vesicle into the synaptic cleft. Okay, and that's how you get uh, fusion of um, the vesicle with the plasma membrane upon an action potential arriving in the axon terminal. Okay, so in the next video, what we will do is we will discuss an assay that Rothman did um, um, to show that you need something along the lines of this to stop these snare complexes from just fusing the synaptic vesicle with uh, the plasma membrane.